Okay, so our first um, our first presentation today, our first panel meeting today, uh, is going to talk about the technology of tomorrow. Does 3D printing have a sustainable future in the apparel industry? So I'd like to introduce the, the panelists one by one. Uh, Nicholas, please. Nicholas O'Donnell Hare Hall, could you please step up? And Nicholas is going to tell us briefly his background. Hello, can you hear me? Um, yep, I'm Nicholas and I'm from the design consultancy St. H and we work predominantly in product development and 3D printing. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Sylvia. Sylvia uh, uh, Weidenbach. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Silvia Weidenbach and I'm, truly, uh, I'm a jewelry artist and designer and my background is more traditional. I come from a craft background and an artistic background and I'm interested in, also I work now with new technology, it's a new tool and I'm interested in both, in the analog and the digital world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvia. Next is uh, Peter Firth. Hi everyone, um, my name is Peter Firth, I'm the uh, senior journalist uh, with LSN Global and we look at 14 different lifestyle sectors um, trying to look at what's new and next uh, in consumer thinking and we've been covering 3D printing now since, you know, since its kind of inception um, so looking forward to talking to you. And uh, last but not least by any means is um, uh, Brian Okniansky. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian. Um, I'm working in the worlds of architecture and footwear design, uh, and I've bridged the two disciplines through the use of additive and subtractive manufacturing technologies, uh, but I've been using 3D printing almost exclusively to develop um, affordable ranges of footwear that are 3D printed that you can actually wear. Okay, thank you. Now, this is, uh, this is uh, designed to be a completely interactive discussion between the panelists and yourselves. So if you have a question, you have something to say, please put your hand up and you'll be handed a microphone so that you can join in the discussion. Okay, so the first topic that we're gonna consider is the, is the top one on the screen. Is 3D printing really just a short-lived hype or are there further opportunities yet to be realized that require industrial and or consumer patients to achieve? Who would like to take that one? Who's, okay, thank you, that's uh, Peter. So, I mean, the idea that 3D printing is just um, a, a kind of short-lived hype is, is just totally preposterous. I mean, we're at the, the kind of the base of a, of a real mountain of disruption, I think, which is kind of comparable to the last two industrial revolutions. I mean, what's really interesting, though, is the fact that the first industrial revolution in the 17th century was all about... Um, kind of increasing our kind of our brawn power, if increasing our kind of mechanical properties as human beings. Then the second industrial revolution, the computerized revolution, was all about brain power and it was about managing information and communicating better. What's really interesting about this next phase of 3D printing and fabrication is it kind of merges the two of them. So you have the kind of you know manufacturing properties and the um, diffusion of kind of enabling everybody to be craftsmen again but you also have the information aspect of it I think that's what's really interesting okay having been through both architecture schools and um, both as a student and teaching and uh, also footwear programs uh, and seeing how generally people approach 3D printing, there is um, a tendency for people to just exploit it for the immediate gratification of what it is capable of doing. Um, I personally think that patience is very important because I think we can very easily burn out on the interest in 3D printing as a viable kind of maybe a paradigm shift in manufacturing. Um, I don't know if there's any references in history of when a new technology has required kind of patience on the side of consumers, 
but I really think 3D printing poses this challenge where the people who employ 3D printing um, need to kind of curate the technology, not in a way that just um, produces for the sake of producing, but actually pushes the technology to make meaningful kind of creations. And it's going to take time, it's going to take phases of development. So that's what patience to me means. Okay. Anybody else want to take that up? Okay. Um, okay, so coming from somebody who has to work with a lot of people who want to 3D print things, who technically doesn't 3D print too many things just for themselves, there seems to be this growing trend just to make things just for the sake of making things. Now, in my eyes, um, if we continue down that route, it will be a short-lived kind of fad where people just use it just for making nonsense objects. Like those kind of little toy mannequins that you can find on Shapeways. <laughs> like in my eyes, they're a bit of a joke because they kind of do nothing. Like they're not, they're not actually progressing it any further. Um, it comes from the technologist side of stuff as well where to continue this kind of uh, rapid expansion of 3D printing, we need to kind of push the materials a hell of a lot further as well. And until we start using it for not just banal objects and using it for genuinely useful things and using it for what the material is actually very good at doing, like a, if you laser sinter something like nylon, it's pretty flexible, but nobody uses it for, it for its flexibility. They always use it to make a solid object. And that, to me, is absolutely insane. It's like, what are you, what are you playing at? Um, so, yeah, um, I'm a little bit kind of pessimistic in some respects, but I think it's down to the people that are actually trying to create things. Unless we start doing what you're doing over there, we're actually using it for its material properties and trying to create something which people can genuinely use because 3D printing can be really cheap, providing that you know how the machines work. But it can be really expensive if we don't really reconsider what it can do. That's kind of... Um, in my case, as well, I think 3D printing is very exciting first, but uh, there is as well an ambiguity. Um, I think at the moment I have this feeling this 3D printing is like in a honeymoon uh, situation. So uh, you have it on the high street, yeah, everyone push the button, we buy this maker board uh, printers, we, we produce as well a lot of plastic fantastic shit, <laughs> but um, I think the important question is, does it make sense to print, yeah? Make it sense to print this piece in nylon, in, in C-core, whatever, or is it maybe more efficient to make it with, with your hands? What's the quality, yeah? Is it, is it interesting? Do, do you want to touch it? Do you want to wear it, in my case? What happens with the material uh, 10 years later? For example, I worked with uh, nylon at the beginning and I realized after one year, because I put it on uh, in my studio, on the window and it gets yellow. Yeah. So, uh, so for me as a maker, these are all very important, important uh, key points. So I see a lot of possibilities there, but this is the same if you if you start, for example, a craftsman's education, yeah, or or you do do a goldsmith's course. You get a piece of copper. You have the torch. You have the bi basic element of fire. You you solder it. You, you realize, oh my God, fantastic colors. But what you do with the colors, yeah, how you bring it in an interesting context to an interesting product that it makes sense. And uh, I see there's a lot of possibilities, but as well um, a lot of changes. I would not say I see it pessimistic. <laughs> I think I see it more as a challenge and uh, as a very interesting um, topic at the moment. Okay. Does anybody in the audience want to pose a question to the panel, make a point? Hello, Philip Worrell from Musto. Um, it is a paradigm. I think this is probably on the verge of something really, really exciting going forward. I think we have an opportunity here, particularly if you're a brand that has to make salesman samples way in advance to shorten your lead time to get product out into the marketplace earlier. I've seen it from where a designer made models out of paper to show the shirts to a very large company in the United States of America. And those models made of paper that he had printed and pulled together won 
uh, one of the largest uh, um, orders that we'd ever received as a business. And so if you can print in 3D and show to a customer exactly what it's going to look like, you don't necessarily need to make salesman samples and have a long lead time. You can shorten your lead times. To me, this is probably one of the most exciting things you could bring to the market. And I, I would encourage anybody to push the boundaries and not look inside the box, look outside the box. Not worry about it going yellow. Let's look for the future. It is exciting and a great opportunity. Thank you, Philip. Anybody I, think right. I think 3D printing has a great opportunity for people to be able to also pilot products. I had a really great conversation with a lady from Estee Lauder recently, and you're thinking, you know, how's a, how's a brand like Estee Lauder going to make use of 3D printing, right? I mean, you'd think that's quite a, a leap. But she was saying they're using it in their kind of innovation labs to kind of try out new stuff and kind of print out kind of new different um, kind of lipstick holders and stuff like that. So it's like when you, when you really open up the notions of what you could do in order to pilot new things and try out and kind of iterate stuff with 3D printers. I think you're right. I think that's really exciting. Okay. Um, you said as well a key point, the time, uh, which I found as well very interesting because this point, before I worked uh, by myself in a studio, but now as well with this 3D printing, yeah, it allows me to work uh, with other people from other fields. We, we can work in a very dynamic way. I work, for example, with an architect and now with a multimedia artist, and we are not based in the same city. Yeah, this, uh, my new collaboration is based in Munich, and we can have, in a way, a ping pong game um, via Skype, where we can send quick our own um, products to each other and the other person reacts on my idea and uh, then he, I react on his idea and I think this is really fantastic as well in a, in a creative uh, medium that you can react very quick and directly and uh, you need not to build it in paper, you can see, you have not uh, gravity, yeah, you can get ra really crazy and wild on the screen and can quick check, okay, is it possible in this size or better in, in a smaller size? Yeah. I just wanted to mention quickly, I'm 100% in the same line of thinking as you. Um, sorry, for, didn't catch your name. But um, the interesting thing here is that R&D is usually something that happens behind the scenes and then a product is released. And what we're seeing with 3D printing is that your product that you're releasing is the R&D. We are creating products with confidence, with improving technology. It's improving fast, just in the same way that Moore's Law predicts that um, you know computing doubles in power every, what is it, 18 months or something? Um, so the products that we can make, assuming we're thinking out of the box and we're being innovative, um, it's evolution in the eye, you know, right in front of the consumer. And I think that's the really brilliant thing that 3D printing is allowing us to do. It's a risk, yes, but these are the early stages. I mean, 3D printing is 30 years old. It's not technically new. However, only since last year has it gone into the free papers that are circulating around London. So it's in Metro, it's in Evening Standard and things like that. So all of a sudden, it's mainstream. And so now, you know, the iron's hot, so to say. Um, but uh, thinking outside the box is, is critical. But also adopting this um, philosophy that you're releasing R&D. You're releasing a product because you can do it faster and you can learn from it faster. But there's no reason that you should wait to release it to an audience. Because we're also kind of in this world of, um, diff you know, hyper-connectivity. There's a different community out there, and there's a different feedback. And the nice thing about the relationship between 3D printing and fashion is that it's not just for the fashion conscious. It's also for the people who are interested in technology and things. So all of a sudden, the demographic is a little wider. So innovation can reach farther. Thank you. Any more points on that one? OK. Uh, if not, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next topic, uh, which certainly interests me, is what does 3D printing actually allow you to do, the whole range, prioritizing culture and use beyond aesthetics? Okay. 
I guess this kind of jumps back to your point in the back there again. Um, what does it really allow you to do? You can prototype things, sure. Um, you can you can make pretty much anything actually. Um, you can make a product that's fit for market. We've recently just made a product which doesn't need to be mass manufactured in one hit. You can make them every time a cost effective nature on a 3D printing machine. It completely wrecks this kind of, oh, let's get it made in China, let's get it made in wherever um, point of view, because we can actually just send a file across oceans, have it 3D printed wherever that's more local, and then you've cut in half your costs for transport. I know it's not like a big deal if you're a, a larger corporation, but we're a small design consultancy, and if we can minimize the amount of transport, then it's a good thing. So, I mean, what, do you know what, like, what does it really allow you to do? Like, a, as far as your imagination can kind of take you, that's, that's where it's going to lead you, because it's, it's really doing more than what it does within aesthetics. People seem to look at it as a sense of, oh, um, what kind of cool kind of uh, shapes can I get this into? What can I bring this into beyond the handmade? Which I find really interesting, but it's everything that it allows you to do outside of the 3D printer, too. The fact that you don't need to send a physical object to places anymore. Like as soon as you get these things into people's houses, you can then do all of your product shopping online and you don't really need to try anything on because you can scale everything at home. Part of the issue that we're gonna start coming up against when people get like maker bots, like you said, or any one of these cheap 3D printers at home is that people actually have to fundamentally learn a 3D program. <laughs> That's the hard thing. Like I don't know about yourself, I mean you work in 3D as well. Like it's learning like anything like Rhino or Matrix or or a CAD, like these aren't like programs which you can learn overnight. They are they're a lengthy process and to be able to get it using effectively, that's a bit of another ball game. But as soon as you do, the it just it I don't know. If I was in the apparel industry, I'd be kind of worried, <laughs> personally, because you, unless you're kind of allowing people to uh, customise your items, they're going to start doing it anyway. It's as simple as that. Um, as soon as you get a load of people, if you're making jewellery and you allow your rings to be downloaded elsewhere, like people will start packing them into 3D programs and just changing them whether you like it or not. It's like, <laughs> it's too easy not to. We do it on a daily basis because it's fun. Like <laughs> so where, what was the other part of that question? I can't even see that. Uh, Your question, what does 3D printing actually allow you to do? Yes. Yeah, so Prioritizing culture and use beyond these things. So the culture side of things, Giving people a little, this is what I was getting at, allowing people just to kind of print whatever they like and able to customise anything they like. The, the culture's fundamentally changed. Um, although we're just starting to accept that, there's, there's so many websites out there you can download multiple different files, like uh, Thingiverse or Shapeways. All these files are widely accessible. The only kind of key point is bringing uh, the 3D printer itself down to a minimal cost, which if we remember back to when uh, just paper printers came out, they were pretty expensive in the beginning. These are actually cheaper now than when original paper printers came out. <coughs> like the, the market price point at the beginning is kind of mental. Um, so the actual culture around it is going to be the big thing to watch, I guess. Not because people are just interested, but because the kind of the trade that is going to absolutely kind of disrupt in the central aspect. Um, what you said, for example, in the <coughs> in the jewelry context, so you can print as well in gold at the moment, and I think that's quite I interesting. And what I found um, exciting in a way is, yeah, or well as well a little bit dangerous, if you can print now in gold, um, maybe in the future, if, if this printer gets the same quality like a cast, then uh, you, you lost a lot of uh, this, uh, this casting industry because everyone uh, prints it, and um, or as well in, in the dentist um, business. Um, so the, the contact with the <laughs> human body or the personal contact is I miss a little bit uh, because sometimes I like it as well to have the personal contact with the people uh, to understand how things are made um, and this sometimes I can't control really so <laughs> um, yeah and uh, I as well for 
two weeks I had an interesting conversation with some people from the Victoria and Albert Museum because they think now how to conserve the material. Yeah? If, uh, for, for example, a museum buys a piece, a 3D printed file. You as a maker, do you give the file directly or if dresses, yeah, if, do you give the file directly to the museum so that in 20 years, but you, because you don't know how the material reacts sometimes, um, yeah, so this I found as well a very interesting question. Yeah, well, are we now in a new digital middle age? The short answer is that 3D printing lets you do anything you can think of. Anything. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, that has cultural implications and I think aesthetics are folded into culture. Um, Nicholas mentioned hacking. I think that's a cultural aspect. So if you're in the apparel or fashion industry and you're trying to use 3D printing, um, typical business models of creating products to put in retail stores and things like that, that's not necessarily the best way forward if we're talking about 3D printing. All of a sudden we're seeing kind of um, 3D printing bringing <coughs> fashion to what iTunes has done for music. You can buy a track for 79p or whatever, and it's yours kind of thing. So the whole retail experience is about to change. Um, and um, the 3D printer, printing industry is forcefully trying to get more 3D printers in people's homes. And I would be surprised if within five years, um, one in five, fa I'm saying a crazy statistic here, it's just a feeling that one in five families are gonna have a paper printer and a 3D printer, even if they don't know how to design. And all the companies that make 3D printers, they come up with their own software to make it kind of idiot proof. So someone with no uh, training in design can actually partake in the experience. So 3D printing allows you to do anything you can imagine. It just takes um, a design skill in a software package to kind of make it a reality. Um, but I believe there's another topic in here that talks about um, the downsides or the plus and minuses of being able to create anything you want. Um, but I think that directly impacts culture. Yeah, I think there's a lot of focus isn't there, with 3D printing on the idea that everyone's going to be able to do it. So there's its total access of creation, which is which is obviously incredible. You know, that's one of the massive shifts that we're we're here to talk about. But also the fact that 3D printing allows you to create things in a way that CNC and creating molds and traditional methods of manufacturing don't have the kind of finesse necessarily in order to actually do. I mean give you a kind of thought in terms of how far that's going. I mean, in, uh, I think it's Harvard University recently created a battery, the smallest battery ever created, which is the size of a piece of rice. And the way they could do that is they used a 3D printer with a tip, which, which was just a millimetre wide. And so they, they kind of threaded this, um, this kind of substance around in a cone shape, which then created an electrode. And so they're, you know, they're huge, huge, kind of far-reaching um, ramifications with that kind of stuff. So it, there, it's really exciting on two levels in the way that you can now fabricate anything from kind of cellular matter to um, gold. But not just the fact that that's going to come to your home, but the fact that that's going to allow businesses and anybody to create in ways that no one has actually created before. Interesting point. Um, one thing that 3D printing enables us to do is that we're moved from a system where if you have a product that you want to develop and take to market, chances are you're going to have to get some real estate and put a bunch of machines inside of it that can handle a, a certain amount of output. Um, the investment now with 3D printing is that it's one machine that can churn out anything. Well, there are limitations within each kind of 3D printer, but the point is that you're not investing in multiple machines that serve one purpose. You're investing in a machine that can output far more products. If they don't have to have anything to do with each other from one product to the next. So that's an interesting thing that's happening with 3D printing. Okay, any, uh, any comments from the audience? 
Okay, rather than just go down the, uh, the list, um, as we're all uh, from apparel here, I would suggest that we try and expand that last question and say what does wearable technology mean for the fashion industry and what role does 3D printing play in this field? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of talk ab around wearable technology. Um, I went to CES at the beginning of the year, you know, the Consumer Elo Electronics Show, and it was all about, you know, which, which tech manufacturer is going to kind of roll out the most flashy concept, you know, around an OLED screen, which, which is flappy, basically. Um, what I think 3D printing really has to do with that is there was a, there's a real breakthrough recently where... I think it was at the North Carolina University where they, they found that by combining two alloy metals using 3D printing fabrication technology, they could essentially make liquid, I know it sounds far out, but they could actually make liquid metal, a kind of metal which is liquid inside but which has a kind of, a, a sort of very, very thin skin when it reacts with the air, which means that you can now make metal which can, is stretchy, not just bendy. So when instead of just having something which flaps, you can have something which extends. So I think that's the, that's an, that's the real way that 3D printing is going to feed into wearable technologies. Most of what I've seen, what I've seen um, in terms of 3D printed textiles is that it comes out looking like a chain mail. Uh, but that's just early stages of the research where you have interlocking loops that are 3D printed and because of the process um, it's possible just to create this chain mail. Um, there's already been a 3D printed bra and things like this. It can happen, but whether or not it's um, something viable that can replace a product that's traditional, I don't think it's there yet. However, um, a lot of schools around the world are dedicating resources to exactly that are that research into 3d printed textiles because chain mail is just now but the fact that we could 3d print at the nanoscale and create really high performance um, assortments of fibers for performance apparel uh, for example um, I would say give it three to five years and you'll see really amazing either prototypes or products that are going to go out to uh, market. People are already making bags out of 3D printing. I don't remember who it is I met yesterday, but um, there you are. So it's happening right in front of us. Um, but I guess I can only offer a warning because um, I'm really focused on footwear right now. Uh, but 3D printed textiles is a huge area of research in universities around the world. Mike, as a for example, Iris van, he van Herpen at the moment, I think is a good example. Um, I saw her piece last week in the show studio in London and uh, it's amazing. But from the wearable aspect, it's for me not so um, exciting. So um, I'm not sure if in the textile industry, the street cheap printing has a future because when I, also I'm not from, from the textile, but when I think in, in textile, for me the, 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 I have silk, yeah, cotton, it's very linked directly with my body and with my skin, so I, I, need, I need a good feeling with this. And um, I tried as well this object printer, at the moment you can print in flexible material because I thought, for example, if you make a bracelet, it would be fantastic if you have some flexible material materials, but then after 10 times using the, the material is not uh, working well. So, so these are for me the, the problems at the moment. But yeah, I'm looking forward. <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's being considered in the wrong sense. Maybe uh, instead of in the short term trying to recreate fabrics which are fundamentally unrecreatable because we can't weave 3D fabrics at the moment with a machine. I mean, you could, but it's not going to be very comfortable. And the idea of a, I mean, I don't need to wear a bra, but I think a hard plastic bra is probably uncomfortable. 
<laughs> but from a shoe designing perspective, I would create shoe lasts. Like uh, from, mm -hmm. from a t-shirt perspective, I'd be creating a completely customizable fitted um, mannequin torsos every time. Like you can create these things, they're very cheap. It's just that you need to work out how to bring the prices down further. Like yeah, you can, like a Meccano kit of um, mannequins could be pretty interesting. It's an instantly accessible way to use 3D printing. Um, it's, I think it's more about how can 3D printing allow you to do what you do better instead of how can it just replace something. Like uh, that's the kind of cutoff point. Everyone's trying to get people like me in their companies because like I can just create anything with a 3D file. But I always tell people it's actually how can we allow the goldsmith or the textile designer to do what they do better. Like if they need a torso to be able to create something but they're too expensive, let's make one of them instead. If you need a shoe last because not everybody's foot the same, but you need to create sports shoes personalizable for individual people. Let's 3D scan the person's foot, 3D print that, and then make the shoe. There's a bit of a weird disconnect where people are trying to make the finished product instead of allowing the 3D printing machines get the designers or the creators to do what they do better. Okay. Any points? Uh, Hi, Jamie Tantliff from Decker's Outdoor. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we make shoes, and what we're currently doing with 3D printing is actually printing out our whole bottom pieces and being able to send them over to our China teams with our 3D blueprints and all of that. But now they can actually see exactly what we want them to make instead of this whole change back and forth of, oh, is this what you meant? Is this what you meant? And going back and forth multiple times trying to get it right. Um, we're also making little bike clips that clip into our bikes on our, on our shoes and we're actually able to 3D print them and put them right onto our shoes um, so we're not having to do prototyping. So it's pretty cool stuff and I do see a future, especially in footwear, for 3D printing. Okay. Yeah, good morning, Ben Mears, Conceptable. Um, yeah, on the, same, on the same sort of basis, I've already seen some of my clients sort of taking on early adoption of these things. Um, what they tend to use it for on the footwear side is, for instance, try out the height of a wedge or the shape of a footbed before they actually go to the next stage, uh, which before they would have to get a mold maker in and, and, and go through uh, quite high expenses. Uh, they can afford to try something out quickly and then try it again, and it, the cost and expenditure is actually quite low. On the apparel side, I do agree that from a textile point of view, what I've seen so far with you know, experiments on bathing suits and, 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 and bras and things like that. They're starting to look interesting, they're starting to become more flexible, they're starting to become something that actually might have a future and probably will have a future. But in the short term, what I'm seeing is people think, doing things like buttons, buckles, things that are essentially eventually going to be metal or, or, or plastic that normally have a mold charge and a high setup cost. They try things out in a 3D printing, they, they put it on the samples, they look at it, they judge it, they change it, they print it again, they go to the trade show, then they worry about bulk. Um, if the orders are fairly small, they might 3D print the entire order just to sort of provide a small minimum. If the orders are larger, they might switch to traditional technologies. And that is actually working really well already. And if you sort of just look back, and you, you had you know, one analogy earlier on, but if you look back at you know, the lady next to me who is snapping away on her camera, um, you know, not so many years ago she would have been changing her film right now and, and that technology has completely changed. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, like, like you were mentioning earlier, with 3D printing, the way it's going already, is that we're actually going to be looking at, you know, technologies at the end of the day that we established in the Victorian times that are now going to get a new cousin that actually could replace some of the things we've been doing for years. First of all, I think there is a future for 3D printing and footwear. 100%. But um, I think what you guys are talking about is also along the lines of what Nicholas said. Um, in that sense, bigger companies that are employing 3D printing, it's going to be to kind of see things sooner. It's going to be for prototyping more than it's going to be for creating products. Um, there's another side to the story of 3D printing, and that's startups. The, the fashion startup, the designer that wants to do his or her own thing. Um, 
So people that are in that situation have really nothing to lose and they go full force. I think it's important for the future of 3D printing for both things to get cooked. Um, it's already figured out as a prototyping tool, um, but there's more to do with that as well. Um, but also just um, carte blanche, just let's see what we can do kind of things um, are also very important. Um, I think the reason 3D printing is more appropriately suited currently for footwear is because <coughs> footwear relies on rigidity. Um, and it's easier, I believe, and we're actually capable of 3D printing things that are firm and won't break. And so we have confidence to do platform high heels, which is mainly the kind of footwear that I create. Um, but that said, uh, there's elastic or semi-soft materials that are coming out. Yes, they don't have longevity at the moment. Maybe six months later they'll start cracking and things like that. Uh, but it's very much a kind of le w let's wait and see what happens because the way that I mean we can already 3d print with stem cells So if that's any indication of the broad range of what 3d printing is capable of um, I think everyone in this room eventually uh, Will find a use for 3d printing in their businesses Yeah, I think the the idea that we should um, use 3d printing to to kind of recreate fabrics which are already existing does seem a little bit kind of like trying to create a retrofit for 3D printing, which I, I don't think anyone who is in, in that industry would agree is a, a kind of a good place to go. I mean, I think, I think what's really interesting is, is the kind of design directions we're starting to see come out of 3D printing, which are based not on subtractive manufacturing, but, you know, additive manufacturing, you know, and you're seeing a lot of quite quite interesting pieces come out which are sort of mimicking nature almost by the, by the way that they're additive rather than subtractive. So I think that's really interesting. We're going to see a lot of really, really fascinating new kind of design cues come out from 3D printing in the coming years as, as different kind of garments are yeah, able to be made from them. If product differentiation is important to you, 3D printing is really easy to create product differentiation. It's just different than other things that already exist. So that's actually an interesting point, I believe. Any more points? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <coughs> I'm very curious to know uh, how 3D printing can affect the apparel industry. Uh, especially talking of garments. I mean, I, I'll tell you an experience I had 20 years ago. Uh, I happened to be working in a sort of factory and uh, manufacturers like Shimaseiki and Stoll came up with this new technology called whole garment machine where basically used to be called first by Shima and knit and wear by Stoll where you put the yarn to the machine and the whole garment comes out. Uh, happened to, in the factory I was working, we had around 20 machines and we had to give, send back those machines after a year. The biggest challenge, w challenge was the fit, because a fit is a correlation of, of measurements. I mean, it's, it's not linear measurement, it's linear and uh, you know, uh, curve measurement. I mean, we've been talking about, we've, we've seen the other day uh, how we could speed uh, fitting with fast fit, for example. So, fitting is a fundamental step in our activity in our apparel industry. Uh, and 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 when, when when I look back at what Stoll and Shima did 20 years ago, uh, it's a failure today. I, I hardly see any knit and wear or whole wholly knitted garment out in the market. Uh, I don't see manufacturers adopting that technology. Uh, so I was wondering how, how can 3D printing now become something, you know, uh, for the future in, in the apparel industry and like to have some insight. Maybe that, that there are some steps, some new uh, inventions that I've missed up on. Shima made like a fundamental error with that one though, didn't they? Like I was lucky enough recently to hang out, like what's it like called, the borders between Scotland and England where they do a lot of knitting. 
and they had a whole Garmin machine. The thing was a joke. <laughs> it just didn't seem like it was even considered. It was like, all right, we can make these essentially kind of, it was like a big sock machine, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a silly thing. Um, they, they, people don't twin up technologies enough. Like if they had like 3D scanned somebody first and understood the fit, they would have stood a whole lot of a better chance. Like it's, it's more about twinning technology there. Shima specifically want to own all of their technology all of the time. Like, yeah, if you buy one of their machines, you have to buy this archaic IBM machine with it, which has got technology which predates me, I think. And if they had allowed collaboration to happen between 3D scanning machines and, and actually sophisticated 3D programs, they would have probably done a half good job of it. But what you're talking about is actually what 3D printing is in the fashion context. It's not about trying to kind of print something, because I, mean, I think there's a bit of a confusion with printing and sintering and milling and things like this, because 3D printing isn't one process anyway. There's like six or seven in there. And the materials, there's, there's a good 15 or 20 materials that you can play with at the moment that are realistic to use for any sort of decent quality. And that's not makeup on materials either. Like, I wouldn't go near one of those machines because the quality of it is just shockingly bad. Like, you can print to, like, maybe, if you're lucky, like, three mil precision, like, something like that. We work with machines that do it at, like, 0.02. I guess it is. But for bridging those gaps between, you really need to kind of, uh, well, you, you might just need to kind of make it up as you go and see how it works out because that's effectively what we will probably do. Um, the other aspect is to really consider what it is you're trying to achieve because some technologies just aren't appropriate to their, uh, their desired output. Like if you're trying to kind of make a fabric, I said this before, but if you're trying to make a fabric with a 3D printer, you're barking up the wrong tree. Like it's just the wrong way to go about it. Um, 3D printing in essence already exists in fashion. It's like Shima make those massive, uh, not milling machines, what they called um, knitting machines. They're absolutely fantastic. They're actually quicker than a 3D printer as well. I don't know why we'd try and recreate the same thing. It makes no sense. Uh, you can get jacquard looms, which have been kicking around for ages. Those things are fantastic. I'd love to be able to get a 3D printer to do what that does, but I just won't be able to. <coughs> like you could, you could print a solid object, but the intricacy in it is just unreproducible. The technology is already so advanced in fashion for those kind of applications. Is you kind of just add in work that's unnecessary. One thing I'll riff off of what you just said is the kind of um, aspect of looking to a technology to solve all your problems. Um, I never rely on 3D printing to solve all my problems when it comes to design <coughs> product development. So I still make my own insoles. I do all the leather by hand. There's, you just have to get real with yourself. No, doesn't matter what technology it is, whether it's those knitting machines or whether it's, and, and it's right to say that 3D printing is a blanket term. There's different uh, technologies within the 3D printing umbrella, but for the sake of communication, making things easy, we call it 3D printing. Um, for me, it's a collaboration, this new technology. It's, it's a collaboration between innovation with new technology and innovation with traditional uh, modes of production, materials, methods. Uh, this is really where we are right now. I'm, you know, my mission is to kind of use technology to create things that we could have never had before. But that doesn't mean that I need to rely on a technology, one technology to kind of, or even two or three technologies to kind of do everything for me. It's more of a what is the, what is it that you want? Uh, what are the different ways that you can get around to making it? And if you're hell-bent on using a technology, use it as much as you can. But it's really a collaboration between known successful methods of manufacturing and the ones you create with the new technology. That's what I would offer in terms of how it could be helpful. It really has to do with the person or the people within a company that get real with the technology, not just, like you said, a honeymoon phase. But uh, it's truly a collaboration with um, traditional and new. 
Okay, any more points on that one? That's extremely interesting for me, I know. Um, we've probably covered a lot of what it'll do and how it'll do it, but there's one uh, the topic which really intrigues me is the, the standing at the base of a mountain of disruption with 3D fabrication. What are the implications of the industry, brands, or the environment? I'm enjoying the microphone. Um, do you know what, the amount of disruption is not going to necessarily come in the short term. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have become aware of it, but there's, there's, a, there's an aspect which it, we're increasingly using because of copyrights. Um, there's an aspect mm. of the internet called like the dark web or the deep web or the Tor network, which is a, an, an extensively interesting place. And I mean, I'm not going to say that we sit right on the fringes of 3D printing, but we research into it a hell of a lot and from an aspect which hasn't got like corporate constraints. So we're able to play a lot and play with things which could be illegal and could not be. We're not really worried about that kind of thing. We're interested in progression. So with regards to disrupting it, IP laws, in my eyes, uh, are going to be the next thing which are going to have to be reconsidered in a big way where on the deep web you can download multiple different files that already exist. Like you could, I mean, sorry to say it, but for shoots, like you can download like all sorts of different cells. Like reproducing uh, Gucci shoes is not a difficult act. Like reproducing a Bulgari ring is not a difficult act. I could make one on my own on my computer, but the problem is we shouldn't have to make it already exist. Like if you want to buy those things, then I think if people are able to download it, th that's where the disruption is going to happen. It's not going to be just because uh, people have got these 3D printers in the house. It's the, the action of creating a network around having a 3D printer in the house. Like it, it creates the uh, shop experience a bit of a different ball game. Like even on Amazon, like um, could you foresee a world where you're not buying? Well, you know, you do already. Like look at Kindle; it's the exact same thing. Like you don't buy a book anymore, do you? Like you download it. Um, in the same way as that, you're not going to probably in the next ten years buy um, like replacement things for the back of this microphone. Like if this thing breaks, you could essentially download the casing for it. Like well, I fix things all the time in my flat with 3D printing, just because it's cheap enough to do it. And most manufacturers don't allow people to fix things. So when it comes to sustainability, the fact that people are now becoming able to fix things in their own household and the more acute they get to downloading files and ignoring IP laws, the more sustainable and the more fixable our world's going to become. You'll find that people will stop buying specifically new things on hard products because well, people just don't have as much money anymore. It's just sure as hell a lot cheaper to print one out than buy, go buy a full new, whatever this is, receiver for a microphone when it's just the case and it's broken. I think if people are able to uh, make a fixer culture a lot more welcoming, like, I mean, Patagonia already could do that. We were chatting just earlier, like, uh, Rafa, the cycling gear, if you crash out on your bike, you've got an expensive jacket or an expensive pair of gloves, they'll fix it for you. Well, they'll try to, because it's completely written off, but that to me can be facilitated in your own home. You don't need to kind of hunt down something for your shoe, like if your Nike Plus thing's broken down, like you could essentially, apart from the electronics, as long as the inside's sound, you can then just recreate their casing. And it's not about kind of cutting premiums on profits, it's just creating new areas for premiums and profits, I guess. And um, accepting the fact that things might get a little bit cheaper, but then people will have a lot more longevity in their items. So it's not about creating items for, uh, I mean, you could still keep your perceived obsolescence, but planned obsolescence is just not going to cut it anymore. First, I want to know what the last thing you fixed in your flat with the 3D printer was. <laughs> it was, uh, okay, so you know on an Ikea table you have those little pins? Yeah. The, the top slots on too? Like we lost all of them when we moved. <laughs> They're really easy to make. Brilliant. I mean, what, what I think is really interesting about this, this idea is the fact that in, in Milan in, in uh, when was I there, March, um, we found that there, was a, there were loads and loads of exhibits which were talking about printing things or creating things um, just on demand. So, you, so it's kind of rubbing out this idea of the fact that you, know, you, you, you have a kind of surplus amount of products ever or you kind of using based on the laws of supply and demand you create things in a big factory and then they sell, maybe they don't sell, but they have a life afterwards. And there are so many of these, these exhibits where they were saying, 
No, what we do is in our supply chain, we only make things when we know there's a demand for them. And so they're kind of on demand. And 3D printing enables, enables that to happen really well. In fact, there was, there was one exhibitor which took it so seriously. Um, I went up to, to their, their kind of exhibition and they explained, oh yeah, so it's kind of, we're, we're reimagining the supply chain and we're creating these chairs out of, I think it's uh, some kind of reconstituted grass material. And, but we only create them when there's a demand and when, a, when an order comes through. I said, oh great, can I have a look at the chair? And they said, no, don't be ridiculous, we haven't made it. It's, so, it's like, it's totally, <laughs> we only make them when there's actually a need from a customer. So they didn't even exhibit it at the furniture fair, which seemed totally bizarre. But anyway, so thinking about the, you know, the, the 20th century manufacturing methods, you know, the kind of the centralized manufacturing where, you know, you have a colossal factory which kind of churns out electricity, pollution, um, and all kinds of waste products. That's kind of, by decentralizing that, it means that everything's going to be a lot greener <coughs> as well, I think. So I think that's another really interesting paradigm shift. 3D printers use a colossal amount of energy anyway, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and More than a factory, though. If you've got a factory amount of them, yeah. Like they're, they're insane. They're, they're laser sinters half the time. They are ballistically energy-guzzling machines. Like they are, they're not bad, but if you want to make things on a massive scale, like, you, I wouldn't want to pay for that bill. But at the same time, it, it, there's, there's a disconnect between the amount of materials that you're using as well. Because uh, with uh, nylon Sintram machines, the people that make these materials out in Germany or uh, Z Corp with their powdery machines, they're not giving up what those materials are. And there's no way that somebody's going to try and recycle this excess powder from the machine and try and stick it back in a 400,000 pound 3D printer. Because if you bugger that thing, you've got some excuses to pull out. But that's the thing, like, so all that material is actually excess. Unless people start to work out, like, the best analogy that I was given is the best way to 3D print something is to make uh, one by one sugar cubes and then just fill up the machine because your excess material is minimal because the machine's still going to try and put material where you haven't been because it needs to build a framework for your objects. So there's still quite a lot of waste, but it's, I mean, it's minimal compared, but until people go and put their head in a little window that you can look into these things, you kind of really understand like what it is to make something on the machine. It's super quick, super efficient, and pretty amazing to watch, but there's so many little kind of hurdles to kind of overcome. They're not as waste-free as expected. It's how you populate the machine makes it waste-free, but people tend not to consider those things. So I guess with the laser sintering thing, you know, with when you kind of charge the machine up with powder, I guess someone needs to come along and invent a method of recycling, of recycling that. Yeah. And, and so it's so nylon. Do, it's like it is nylon. Basically. Like it's powdered nylon. It's going to be recyclable easy. Like it comes from oil. Like it's 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 going to be recycled. It's just that it's going to take somebody with the confidence to try and repowder this stuff, or at least kind of re I don't know, re sieve it in some respects and stick it back in their machine, see what happens. No, no, but I wouldn't do it. <laughs> no, just because like the machines are so expensive to either fix or replace. Like, you can do it for makeup, but that stuff's nylon as well, but it comes in a big cord. You can buy it from Maplins. It's not so bad. Like reckon an 800-pound machine compared to a half a million pound one is <laughs> quite a difference. Yeah, but I'm using bioplastic, and it's not petrol-based. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. this is what I'm saying. Yeah. That you're talking about one kind of 3D printing, and it's up to the person. You still, you still have waste. It's just not as bad. Well, like that's a start, I no, think. No, 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 I completely agree. Like, I, I totally agree. Like, yeah. uh, bioplastics are a good thing. Um, uh, yeah, it depends what you consider to be the waste. You've still got to, uh, on a large scale, remove it. And, and, um, sorry. and I think as well, w when you see um, where the machine, where they produce the machine, yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere <laughs> where nobody controls it. So I think this is as well a very important point to think about it. Yeah, not only to use a, okay, I use a sustainable material, yeah, but the machine, <laughs> how, where they make it, in the desert, nobody controls it, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, so this is 
really tricky. Yeah, well, I <laughs> haven't chased up the manufacturers who make the materials, but no one's complaining about it on a wide scale. But in s as far as disruption uh, for brands and the industry, IP is a big thing. Um, the interesting thing that I think uh, 3D printing can do is that companies can begin to outsource production to the customer, you know, which is, I think, an interesting concept. Um, I'm not saying give everything away, because at the end of the day, you need to buy the iPhone in order to enjoy iPhone cases. But I think part of the disruption that 3D printing uh, kind of brings to the table is um, that companies can now design things, but they actually don't have to invest in making them or all of the things that you design. Um, so that's a different kind of paradigm in setting up a business and you know, engineering a kind of uh, how you constitute your business. Um, what I see in terms of IP, intellectual property protection, um, is that people are treating it traditionally and we're not learning any lessons from the music industry. Um, I just think the, a really disruptive thing in terms of intellectual property is um, Sorry, I have to gather the thought. You, you can't go about it the way that it's always been going, how you've been going about it. So there needs to be new ways to think about it. And I think that 3D printing will allow brands to communicate with their audience uh, and expand their audience, like I mentioned earlier, that now you're not just dealing with fashion and people interested in apparel, but you're also engaging people who didn't even know they were interested in apparel per se, but were interested in technology. But all of a sudden, um, if more people have 3D printers at home, then the brand goes straight to your home. And I think that's something that's fairly disruptive. It's different. Do you think the digital rights should be used in this respect, as it is in, uh, is in music and books? At the end of the day, all we can do is put a checkbox on a website that says, I agree to your terms and conditions, but people still do whatever they want and you can spend a lot of money litigating. Uh, I think there's a different way to do things. I think the analogy of you have to buy the iPhone to enjoy iPhone cases is really a, a, a tipping point in how to use this in a disruptive way. Um, there's certain things you don't give up and there's certain things that you should give up. Right. On, on the subject of a digital printer in every home, uh, I can see um, I can see the the same situation arising as we, we do with, the, with paper printers, and that they'll give they'll subsidise the printers, give them away at a vastly reduced price, and then you pay an arm and a leg for the uh, for the powders and the materials, like we do for ink. It's actually cheaper to buy a, buy a newspaper than download it and print it they can't on, on do your that, home they. printer. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of already do that. Well, that powder is like ballistically expensive. Like mm. to, f to fill up a 3D printer with the stuff, it's they're, they're just not doing it on like a public level yet. No, but uh, yeah. I'm going to no, say a will, digital will printer in every happen. home. Yeah. <laughs> I can absolutely. see the prospect looming. That's all. Yeah, yeah absolutely. D there's a there's another topic up there which I think we're sort of leading into. What are the what are the material limitations uh, on on the digital printing? I guess in the jewellery industry especially, um, there's this anticipation that you can kind of create absolutely anything, which you can in the foreground, and if as long as you don't want to make a second one, like it's fine, or like 3D print a second one anyway. Um, ultimately, as I, I mean, I say from experience within jewellery, it's, it's understanding the material of the end product. It's very easy to make things exceptionally thin in 3D printers. It's very easy to make things really amazing with convoluted shapes that... Ultimately, at some point, at the moment, if you want to cast something, um, you still have to consider the analog kind of manufacture techniques. If you want to make something on a large scale, we've still got to anticipate how it is this is going to be molded or any of the above, really. Uh, the, mat the material limitations isn't so much on the material limitations of the 3D object if you're only making a prototype. There is limitations if you're trying to take that prototype to market as an actual object. But unless, well that doesn't happen too much anymore though, at the moment, where people don't kind of take straight to, straight to uh, market 
products. I mean, we're trying to, but it's not as easy as you anticipate exactly from what you said, because if you put some of these materials in light for too long, like they go yellow, <laughs> and then people are like, oh, you've sold me like a bum kind of object. But it's not true. It's just that we just haven't had time to realistically test these things over a long period of time. It's cool with like uh, rubber soles and things like this, where they've had like a sure as hell, like a long period of time to get to grips and make sure they're kind of good. But like in the short run, they were getting those wrong as well. But I think uh, it, the material, uh, like understanding the material um, area, it needs to, you need to kind of work out what your end product's actually going to be and uh, providing there's not a disconnect in there means you don't really have too many limitations, like you're kind of limited by your own material usage, but if you are intending on casting something at some point, then you're you're in for a roller coaster because you can make anything, but you can't necessarily produce it on a large scale. Um, my experience with material are that um, as we treat the printing, you can print big pieces, very hollow pieces, not so heavy pieces, and you can as well include in a closed object some flexible elements, and you can print it in one, and this is quite interesting. Um, with the material, so so my wish for the future would be um, if some engineer people develop maybe more a fusion of different materials. At the moment you can print only SLS, C-Core, gold, but you cannot as well, um, my vision for example would be if I, if I have a gold printer or, or a nylon printer like this piece and I can include directly an other material like a hands handmade material and not add it later. So <laughs> this would be for me a really interesting challenge and there I see at the moment the limitations that I have not, that I cannot combine um, SLS print with that I say okay the first layer is SLS because I need a little bit of flexible material and then the top because I love this crazy color is in C-Core. So this is not uh, possible at the moment that you can fuse different uh, printers. So there is for me the limitation. Okay, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end now. Perhaps one more, one more comment? Sure, I mean, um, the fact that 3D printing was for a long, called, long time called rapid prototyping, it means to say that all 3D printers can make representational objects. Uh, and so if you're not looking to make things that have to handle force, torque or someone stepping on things, then all 3D printers really won't have any limitations for you. It's just a matter of which ones can create colors that you like or which ones are conducive to post-production techniques that you usually use. When you go into uh, things that need to withstand force, it's a whole different, um, well, there's a lot of limitations. And there's really three kinds of, three tiers of 3D printing. The kind of 3D printers that cost 2,000 pounds and less the kind that cost 20,000 and up, and the kinds that cost 200,000 and up. And the interesting thing you see is that um, at the lowest tier of 3D printing, the material limitations depend on the designer. Because you can design things thicker and uh, create more density within an object so that uh, you can step on it and walk in it and it can handle all those forces. When you go into the 20,000 range, it's just pure representation. You can print with the most colors as well but you can't step on it. You know, you can't even, y you could crush it in your hand basically, unless it's a fairly big object. Uh, and then you go to the highest tier and it's internationally recognized materials with uh, an enormous amount of data and it'll tell you how long they'll last and what their limitations are. So the science is very figured out in terms of the materials that you use for 3D printing. Uh, the only problem is when you get to the most expensive tier of 3, 3D printing, there are virtually no color options. And when you go to the cheapest kind of 3D printing, you do have color options, but it's the slowest. So there's a really interesting thing going on with technologies within 3D printing, and you have to take them all on board depending on what you're trying to make. Okay, well, we've just about run out of time. Uh, I've learned a heck of a lot. So uh, many thanks to Brian, Peter, Sylvia, and Nicholas for a, a very instructive session. Thanks a lot. <laughs>